All right. Well, we're here at the top of the hour, so I want to welcome everyone. Uh, looks like we have a little over 50 folks joining us, still people logging in. So uh, we're glad to have you. And so, uh, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind, let's make sure we're recording if we're not already. And I just want to uh, begin uh, by welcoming you. Um, my name is uh, Scott Postman. I'm the president of Kepler Education. And uh, we are, uh, just in brief, a consortium of independent teachers who are unified by a shared vision and an innovative platform uh, so that we can bring classical liberal arts education to junior high and high school students. And uh, this is what uh, Kepler is all about. And we're very excited to bring you this four part webinar and uh, help in a, in a time of crisis uh, to uh, provide some guidance and, and some insight on how to use online tools uh, to teach online. We think that there's um, some fantastic opportunities. And so we'll talk a little bit about those today. Now, Aristotle is famous for his um, poetics when he said that a whole is that which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And he uh, discusses a well-constructed plot uh, and that a well-constructed plot has these three elements. So there's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I want to submit to you that teaching online is much the same as a well-constructed plot. If we're going to be successful, there is a formula, if you will, that, uh, that will be successful, of course. Um, it's not a, a perfect formula, but uh, there, there are some really important aspects of, um, of teaching online that are a little bit different than, than teaching in the classroom. And so there are some things that you can do online that you can't do in the classroom. And just as there are uh, some things that in a brick and mortar school you'd be able to do that you may not be able to do in an online school. Uh, but the trade-off I think is, um, is well worth it. And particularly in a time when a lot of folks don't have a choice but to go online, uh, we have some really great tools that we hope will be a, a help to you. So here's um, what you can expect. We're going to take a look at the beginning, and the beginning is preparing to teach. So before we ever get into the classroom, the very beginning of, of an effective online classroom has to start with preparation. And um, I can't emphasize this enough. This, this, will, uh, this will prevent a lot of heartache if you do the right kind of preparation. The second thing we're going to talk about today is the middle, and that is how to start the class. So we might think that beginning the class, that that's, you know, that, that would be the middle, uh, or that would be the beginning, uh, but rather that's really the middle. It's, it's how to start a class, and, and if we don't start correctly, then we're going we're gonna to run into all kinds of, of trouble as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about the end, that's how to teach in an online classroom, and that's really the end of it. That's really uh, the conclusion, uh, the, you know, the climax and the denouement of, of all teaching, you know, uh, or being in the classroom is this end part. We have to have the first two if we're going to be successful. So let's jump right in, and I want to let you know that this webinar is going to assume that most of our teachers are using Zoom. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to use Zoom per se, but I am going to talk a lot about uh, the operations and the functions of Zoom. This is uh, what we use, and I've used a lot of different platforms, everything from WebEx and Adobe Connect, uh, and we have found that uh, Zoom uh, is one of the most powerful and video-centric uh, tools that are available for online teaching right now. And so this is what we use. Now, Daniel Fukushan, our CEO, has uh, uh, created a, a little video for a local co-op here um, that went online. And so they're using uh, those tools. And so if you want to know how to set up an account and, and some of the real basics of, of getting into Zoom, um, we can make that available to you if you want to. It's, it's a rudimentary uh, video. It's something we just prepared just really as a, as a teaching uh, tool. But if you'd like that, uh, we'll make that available to you. So with that said, um, if you're not using Zoom, your classroom environment is probably going to have some similar tools and features. And so you want to do some research on your own platform uh, so that you can accomplish some of these, you know, similar operations. And so besides the instructions that are particular to Zoom that we'll talk about, everything else is going to be more or less universal uh, to all online teaching. And so this particular webinar, this first in, the, in a series of four, is really going to be very practical. 
And some of it, to be really honest, uh, may seem relatively obvious, especially to those who may have taught online before. Um, but we're going to assume, <clears throat> we're going to take the approach that everyone watching this webinar has little to no experience of online teaching, and that's how we're going to get uh, we're going to get started. So the other two, I'll mention at the end again uh, of this uh, of this webinar. The other, excuse me, three webinars we're going to do is going to be how to lecture, how to do a recitation, and how to do workshops. And so we'll get a little more in depth in those webinars on some of the more um, intricate features of, of teaching online, some of the different uh, approaches that you, can, that you can use. So let's go ahead and get started. So th the beginning, we said, is preparing to teach, okay? And the one thing that I cannot emphasize enough when we're, when we're teaching, in line, uh, teaching online is to prepare in advance. And that means you want to make sure you're logged into your Zoom account, you want to make sure your computer is working, um, you don't have an update starting five minutes before class, and believe me, if you've taught online before um, for any length of time, you've probably run into some of these things. You go to log in, you, you're, you're jumping into your classroom, and Windows or, or Mac says, you know, it's time for an update and your computer starts updating and you're stuck. Um, so, so be prepared. Make sure um, your computer is, is ready to go. Make sure if you have, um, you know, uh, a wireless mouse or, or wireless uh, keyboard, make sure these things are all charged. All your devices are charged, um, that, that they're plugged in if, um, you know, if, if that's how you're, how you're working. It's, it's bad enough when a student in the middle of class stops or raises their hand and says, hey, I've got to run grab my, uh, my charger because my computer's about to die. Uh, but it's, it's worse when the teacher does that. <laughs> so, so be prepared. Uh, make sure everything is in working order. Make sure everything's plugged in. Make sure your, your microphone and your, um, your headphones, if you're using headphones, make sure all of that's working well. Now, I recommend teachers, the third thing here in, in preparing, I recommend that teachers plug directly into their router using an ethernet cord, uh, a cable, um, rather than using Wi-Fi. And by using the ethernet, you're gonna have a lot more of a stable connection and, and that's gonna ensure a much better ex experience for, for students. Now I've, I've taught, uh, as I've been traveling, I've taught on things that uh, are smaller, like a, a small um, iPad, one of the, the iPad mini pros. I've taught class on there from Wi-Fi and we were able to do it and it worked just fine. Uh, but our very best experience is when you're plugged into an ethernet cable right directly into the router. Uh, students will often be on Wi-Fi, uh, but you know Wi-Fi still has a little bit of instability at times. Okay, um, if you don't have a relatively soundproof room where you're teaching, um, some area where people aren't going to be coming in and out, or uh, children aren't going to be in the background, then I I, I highly recommend that you use headphones, a quality set of headphones, and microphone. Now I personally don't use a headphone and microphone. I, I teach from a home office that is, is isolated from a lot of distractions. Um, I use a Yeti uh, blue microphone. Uh, those are, uh, you can purchase one of those for about 100 or $150. dollars There, um, it's a little bit of, of upgraded equipment. You don't have to have that to teach online. Uh, but if you don't have a really quiet, isolated place, make sure you have a really good set of headphones and, um, and a microphone and make sure they work. Um, now, there's some simple things that, that we don't often think of until they're actually disrupting the class. Uh, make sure your cell phone is turned off. <clears throat> make sure that, you know, um, someone's watching the baby, that in the middle of class, it's not, you know, you're going to have to jump up and, and, and take care of the children or uh, let the dog out um, or some of the different, um, you know, things we just don't think about when we're teaching in an environment, maybe from home. Um, or uh, a, an office where there's going to be somebody coming in and out of the office or several people using the same room. So, so be thoughtful about those kinds of things. Make sure your distractions are minimized. Um, it's, a, it's a real difficult thing um, until you experience it. It's a difficult thing maybe to even to explain to, um, to be all in, uh, you know, focused on the screen, the students, and, and be engaged there, and then have outside distractions. You're almost in two worlds at one time, and so it can become very distracting, and, and it's very easy for the teacher to get, um, you know, sidetracked or, or things to get disrupted real easy. Another thing to consider is make sure notifications on your computer um, are shut off. 
And right before uh, we started this webinar, I'm going over my computer, making sure all my, my notifications shut off, nothing's dinging or buzzing. And, and so I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I didn't want to in the middle of a webinar telling you not to do that and, and then have those things go off. So, uh, but, but the fact is they do, you don't think about it until you're in the middle of class. So these are a lot of the things that you want to think about. What kinds of distractions um, might present themselves that you wouldn't normally have um, you know, in a, in a classroom that's in a brick and mortar school. And we've all, if, if you've taught in a brick and mortar school, we've all had those distractions where somebody comes in or somebody knocks on the door or somebody's coming in and out and everybody's turned around and now you're teaching to their ear. And, and, and so uh, the online world has a different kind or a different set of distractions that are in addition to those kinds of distractions. So, so be aware of those. Um, Another thing that you want to do in preparing to teach is to make sure all of your resources are prepared ahead of time. And um, you, you'll want to share different resources with students like maps, uh, perhaps a short video, perhaps an image, a picture, a piece of art that you're, you're going to be discussing. Uh, maybe it's a, a table or a text. Uh, that you're going to put up on your screen. And so you want to make sure you have all of these things in place beforehand. You don't want to be Googling or searching around, digging around your files, trying to find it and pull it up as you're, as you're teaching. And a few ways to do that might be to um, open up the images or the documents and then minimize them on your screen so that you can just come through and, and click them and, and enlarge them when you're ready to use them. Another thing, uh, that, that I like to do sometimes is create bookmark if you're going to use a website or um, or some different videos. If you're going to use something like a YouTube video, and you know uh, I'll talk about the use of, of some of these props in a moment, but if you're going to use, uh, say, a short video, uh, make sure before class starts you watch the video and get past all the ads so that you can just kind of scroll it back and start right where you want. You know, there's nothing like, uh, all right, students, uh, let's watch this little excerpt here on, you know, the leaves of grass and then have a video, um, you know, an advertisement for Geico or something playing before you, you're you able to jump in and, and, and talk about this, um, you know, this lecture that somebody may have give, uh, given and, and you're going to analyze this. Um, so so make sure you've watched those and, and, and prepped your video that you it's right, right where you want it uh, to begin with. And things like YouTube, you can actually set the link to the right time uh, in order to do that. Uh, so those are some little tips and tricks you can do. Um, so, so make sure that you're, you're all prepared, uh, not just with your equipment and your technology, but make sure all of your tools and your props and, and resources that you're going to use, PDFs, uh, images, make sure you have those all ready to go uh, before the class even starts. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, prepare your students in advance. And now some of this is going to seem, uh, and, and it is, it, it not only seems, but it really is. Uh, this is true also of a brick and mortar, but in some ways it's even more important when you're online. And, and one of the reasons is because students tend to feel a little bit disconnected when they come onto an, an, an online class. Uh, younger kids are a lot more, you know, they're a lot used to a lot more used to using things like uh, FaceTime and, and video and, and those things maybe than um, even the teachers are. But there is this sort of disconnect. And if a student shows up to class and nobody's there, they're wondering, am I in the right place? Um, you know, I don't know where to find this. I don't know how to get a hold of my teacher. So there's this, uh, this seeming disconnect from the teacher unless the teacher's very prepared and provides the students with the resources they need to feel connected uh, to this online classroom. And so here's a few things to do. Uh, create a syllabus that is detailed and, and you put it in writing and you put it in a PDF and you send it to the students well in advance. Uh, so make sure on that, that syllabus you have your contact information, the classroom link where they're going to log in, the class days and times in the time zone that you are um, uh, that you're teaching, um, and so they know which time zone we're talking about. Um, make sure that you have a schedule uh, for each week of the school year, the semester, or the or the term, uh, well in advance. Don't uh, you know? 
especially in the online uh, situation, you don't want to lead students, all right, this week we're going to go ahead and read this or we're going to do this assignment. You, you want to know in advance where you're going. You want to have it mapped out so they can feel very secure in, um, in knowing where they're going. Make sure that they have access or, or you direct them to the link where they get their resources. If they have to buy a book for the class, if they have to uh, download a resource, make sure they know how to get it. Make sure those links work. Make sure um, that, that there's no question uh, for the students when they, um, when they go to those links, that, that, that they're very secure about that. Um, be sure that your CMS, your, uh, your classroom management system or your learning management system, if you call it an LMS, uh, make sure that the student knows where they turn in their assignment, where they find their grades, and how they communicate with you. Make sure that's spelled out very clearly um, in an online class. Uh, they'll want that up front, and that'll be very, very helpful uh, in making them feel secure that they know where they're going. Be sure to provide a clear set of learning objectives. I know that a lot of times, you know, in a syllabus, it seems that everybody just kind of skips over these, but this is real helpful in showing the students where they're going, what they can anticipate in this class, uh, because it takes a little bit of time to get to know the teacher, to get to know the other students um, when you're in a flipped classroom situation and, um, and you're distanced, um, not, you know, in a brick and mortar five days a week. Uh, uh, interacting every single day. Uh, so make sure that they have a clear set of learning objectives. Make sure your classroom policies are very clear. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some ideas for classroom policies in a moment. But make sure that those are spelled out clearly. Make sure your teacher, uh, as a teacher, your expectations are, are spelled out very clearly. Um, every teacher has a little bit different style. They have a little bit different emphasis and the students need to know who you are and you know, what you expect of them. Um, are you a teacher that's really more interested in them getting the concept than getting the assignment in on time? Then let them know that. If you're a stickler about punctuality and, and you want that assignment in on time, uh, then, then you need to let them know that. Emphasize the things, don't surprise them uh, because it, it's not only discouraging in a brick and mortar, mortar situation, but even more so it seems to be um, exaggerated in an online situation where there's the, the disconnect. Uh, be sure that you have timely and effective communication. Um, I use a policy um, that I think works fairly well. Um, in my syllabus, I tell the students, I generally answer you the same day. Um, almost always within 24 hours. And in very rare cases, if you don't hear from me in 48 hours, be sure to email me again because it may have got buried somewhere or I made a mistake, sent it to the wrong place, whatever. Um, but, but make sure you have a real clear timeline about communication. Um, when can they expect you to respond? Um, you know, obviously in an online situation, you know, a student is not going to be used to just running up and, and asking you a question if they see you in the hallway. But how can they know? What can they expect um, when you are uh, when you're communicating with them? Let them know um, that you have methods for timely and helpful feedback. How will you give them feedback? Will that be in the CMS? Are you using Google Docs and you'll share it, uh, share comments with them? Let them know how you give feedback. And then, of course, how you're going to assess their work in, in grading exams. What kind of rubric do you use? All of these things that are, are still true in a brick and mortar situation, um, the best way I can describe it is they become exaggerated in an online situation just because, again, there is that little bit of um, uh, disconnect. There's not an, an embodied experience. Um, students just need that extra uh, communication, making sure that everything is clear and, and very detailed and outlined. And if you do that and you, and you, you prepare, you're going to have a far superior experience than if you're trying to wing it and, and figure it out as you go. Okay. One thing that I would highly recommend in preparation, and then we'll move on to the middle, um, I would recommend an orientation. If you... Um, you can do the orientation, say, a week in advance before the first day of class. Um, it would be a shortened class, but say at the same time as the class would meet, same time and day. Or you can make the first day of the year, if, if that would fit into your syllabus, the first day of the year. You can make that an orientation. I, I recommend a day in advance. The orientation is designed where the students can introduce themselves. They can meet you. You can walk them through all the tools that you're going to expect them to use, how to raise their hand, how to chat in the chat box, how to log into class, 
how to fix their microphone problems, how to fix their, um, you know, their video camera problems, you know, what, you know, what kinds of things can you anticipate? Um, and, and you also get to know the students a little bit. You, you'll get to know which students seem to be a little more adept to the online experience and which students are going to struggle. And so make sure you designate a time that you go through this um, experience together, just completely practicing together. And, and when all the students are comfortable with it and you're comfortable with it, you're gonna have a much better experience, okay? All right, um, let's move on to the middle. Now, how do you start a class? Preparing is, is extremely important, but then how you start the class is also going to uh, lend to a very, um, you know, different kind of experience. If you start poorly, it'll be a poor experience. If you start well, um, it'll be a much better experience. So uh, number one, be, be punctual. Um, a student that shows up, and, and believe me, I've been there where, um, uh, matter of fact, recently traveling and uh, missed a time zone and, you know, getting emails from students. Are you there, Mr. Postman? Are we having class? <coughs> Excuse me. And and that, that becomes a real, you know, that, that becomes a real um, anxiety um, experience, you know, a anxious experience for, for the students when they don't know where you're at or, or why you're not there. And so I recommend logging in 10 minutes early. And I typically log in about a quarter tail or 10 tail. And I continue to do other prep work um, while I'm waiting, but I, but I usually log in about 10 or 15 minutes before. And then about five minutes before class, you can do some things like um, you could share a quote. You could share an image. You could play some music. Um, just something to kind of know that uh, students, as they're coming into class and getting settled, that you're there. There's something to think about or interact with. It may even be a little bit of a hat tip to what you're going to discuss that day or what you're going to analyze or consider in, in class that day. And then I always recommend uh, as much as possible, start the class right on time. Be very punctual. And, and this does a couple of things. It, um, there's a tendency with some people as they, as they come to the classroom that's online that they kind of leisurely, um, you know, they log in, they kind of get settled. But by that time, others are, are getting started in class or the class is already starting and, and they kind of, they come in at a later time. And if they get comfortable doing that, then it's going to continue to push your class back just like it would happen in a brick and mortar situation. It's going to continue to push your class time back. And so start on time, you know, at the top of the hour, if you start at say 8 a.m. Pacific time, start at 8 a.m. You log in or you turn on your camera and your microphone and then begin greeting students. So start right on time, even if all the students aren't there. And then one way that you can kind of give a minute if, if students are, are still logging in or, or they may be running late or something is um, we do what's called a mic check before we begin recording our class. And um, some schools um, use do a mic check and just have every student walk through and say, check, 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 you know, make sure that all works. What I typically like to do is just greet the students and it's a way to just to kind of begin, um, you know, seeing what kind of mood everybody's in, see how everybody's doing, what can I expect in the classroom that day? And so I'll greet the student, you know, uh, you know, good morning, Noah, how are you doing today? Good morning, Michael, you know, and, and just begin greeting the students and then make them use their microphone to answer you, not to put something in the chat, not to wave at you on the screen, but have your students answer on the microphone. Let them know, explain to them. I'm gonna greet you in the morning, and when I greet you, I'd like you to turn on your microphone, uh, you know, respond, and then you can turn it off. So then we can discover if everyone's equipment is working properly, okay? And so the mic checks are very important, and I'm gonna to talk to you in just a moment about how to handle um, the, the, the tech troubles when they come up, um, and it's usually at this time when you're logging into class, sometimes the drivers of different computers kind of get uh, scrambled or, or something happens. And there's a real simple way to fix this. Um, and, and it's about 90, you know, 95% of the time it's effective um, in solving the issue. Uh, but it, it has something to do with students all logging in at the same time. And, and so it's a real simple fix. But use the mic check to make sure everybody's there to take roll and to make sure their equipment's working. So it's, a, it's very quick, it only takes just a couple of minutes. Now, if the technology is broken, uh, the, the number one thing is says, don't panic. Um, there's, again, there's this kind of anxiety that tends to come 
um, when you're in an online class, whether you're the instructor or whether you're the student, if things begin to act up, there's this anxiety about, oh no, what do I do? People begin to panic. And so um, if there's a problem, a student goes to use their microphone and it doesn't work, um, encourage them, all right, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out, here's, you know, here, here's a couple of steps to take. Sometimes if you just unplug and plug their headphones or microphone jack back in, sometimes it's just a loose connection or they didn't plug it all the way in, I check that first. Second thing I'll have them do is if, if their camera's not showing up, if, if you're in Zoom and you click on the participation, uh, the participants, there's a little button you can look at all the participants, it will tell you whose camera's on and if there's a, if there's a camera and a microphone attached. I'll typically look there and if I see that their microphone's attached but they're not getting through, um, then I'll know that um, it, it probably just needs to be reset. And so I'll tell the student, log out and log back in. If I notice that there's not a camera or a microphone uh, present and they're having that trouble, then I'll ask them to log out, reboot their device, and then log back in. And it may take them a couple of minutes to do that and that's perfectly fine. Then you just move on with class while they're, while they're doing that. So um, have them unplug and plug things back in, fixes it a lot of the time, have them log out, log back in. If, if it, the first doesn't, that usually does. And then 99% um, of the time, if they log out, reboot, log back in, whatever the issue was typically fixes itself. If it's not fixable, if there's a problem, then I typically go on with the class and I tell the student, go ahead and work on that quietly. And if you get it working, um, you can begin engaging class. Otherwise, you'll watch the recording later on, uh, but work on it and see if you can't get it fixed. We're gonna move on with class. Um, after class, I'll typically send an email to the parents to let them know what the situation is. If it's a device problem, say a camera's broken or a microphone's broken, then I typically give a, a week grace period for them to order a new part or get it in or get it fixed, whatever needs to happen, and it doesn't affect their participation grade. Uh, but after a week, um, if they haven't done the work that needs to be to be done, it will affect their participation grade because they need this equipment uh, to show up to class. So it'd be like a student sitting in the back of the classroom in a brick and mortar school who doesn't engage or doesn't answer questions. And so we want all the students in, engaged. So have them um, unplug and plug back in, have them log out, log back in, and then have them log out, uh, reboot, and log back in. Those would be the steps. If the first one works, great. Sec if it doesn't, do the second. And if, if it still doesn't, try the third. And then last of all, you'll send an email to the parents, send the recording to the student, and um, let the, the parents work with the student and get the equipment fixed, okay? Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. The other thing, a uh, couple other things, make sure you always record your class. I cannot emphasize this enough. There's a variety of reasons. The primary reason is you want um, to have a resource that if the student misses it, or if, if they um, wanna go back and review something that they were discussing, uh, they have access to that recording. And so we make the recordings available to students, and, um, and many of them take advantage of that. They go back in and, and, and doing their uh, prep and study, they'll use those, uh, but record those classes, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, um, uh, sorry, yeah, recording the classes, the students can, can review those. The other thing that, that students will be able to do with, um, uh, or you'll be able to do with the recording, if there ever comes up a disciplinary issue, if anything ever comes up that is uh, a, your word against theirs kind of a situation, it's recorded. It's right there. Uh, there's no question. And, um, and it, it protects the teacher and the student. And it also uh, allows the student to be able to use that as a, um, as a resource. Okay. Um, continuing on, uh, pray with your students. So, uh, so you're going to uh, do your mic check. You're going to start recording. And then I pray with the students. So we begin class uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, occasionally I'll read a short poem or maybe share a quote, something that's relevant to that day and uh, just engage the students with, uh, with something that might be delightful and, um, and uh, intriguing that piques their interest. Uh, and we pray with them and share that. Then I spend about one to three minutes. This sounds like this takes a long time, but really all this takes place in about five minutes. Um, then we do housekeeping. In about one to three minutes, we talk about 
here's what's coming down the pike. Here's what can be expected. Here's when your rough drafts do. Um, here's a change to the syllabus we need to be aware of. Anything that you need to do to make sure everybody's on the same page, I take just a couple of minutes to do that at the very beginning of the class. And then we move into the actual class time, okay? Um, so, so this beginning, this, this starting, um, this, this online um, uh, you know, teaching segment of the middle, beginning the class, starting out right, is going to set the, the precedent uh, for the rest of, of what's going to happen. Okay, um, now let's go to the actual teaching time. You've done your prep work, you're all ready to go, you've got your resources, your equipment's working, you've got the students coming in, um, you have checked out their equipment, helped them, you have uh, started the recording of your class, you have prayed, you've done your housekeeping, and now you're involved in the class. So here are several things that are very important um, to consider. Number one, in Zoom, and I think in just about every other platform, you, if you go into the settings, there is a place to turn off private chat between the students. It still allows the student to private chat the teacher and say, um, I didn't finish my homework, you know, or, or whatever, um, or uh, to be able to talk to the whole class, all the chats will be public. But turning off the private chat between students is essential. Um, I promise you, they will, uh, if they have a way of engaging and talking while the teacher's talking, they will do it. Another place to be aware of, if you use Google Docs, collaborative documents, students um, can jump on a Google Doc and begin uh, texting there. They'll share a link. I've had the, had the students do that before. Um, so make sure that you're in control of any of the Google Docs um, or, or some of those uh, that are being used. If uh, there's any question, I always involve the parent, ask them to check on it, and um, you know, and, and try to resolve that that issue. Zoom has a really interesting feature, and um, we'll share this. Um, I'll share this uh, with you. I, th I think um, I was going to to give this link, but you can you can Google it. Um, actually, Daniel, I think on that other document I shared with you, there is a link to this the Zoom article in their help feature. There's also a feature in Zoom, in, in the settings, that um, we'll share that link with you where to go, that if you're sh sharing something on your screen, you're sharing your screen, just like I'm doing right now, and a student isn't paying attention, and, um, and, and, and you're you know, giving a lecture, you're doing a recitation, and the student is, is back there messing around, or they pull up a video, and they've got it muted, and they're watching a video or listening to music, Zoom will, will notify you and let you know that uh, the student is not focused because there's another screen operating or uh, over the top of Zoom. And so it's a fantastic feature to make sure students um, aren't doing something they shouldn't be doing on the, other, on the other end. And then you can privately message the student and let them know that you know and uh, for them to please re-engage. And then I typically send an email to the afterward uh, to let them know uh, that that's happening. But these are some ways that um, uh, that are, it's, it's called um, attention tracking These are and, and turning off private chats. These are some ways that you can kind of control the interaction that the students are having. Um, as with anything, uh, I've administrated for, um, you know, over 20 years, and we've had students that used to literally stick pencil leads underneath their fingernails so that they, when they would go to their score key, they could write uh, the answer, you know, in the score key, um, or write their answer on, on the page when they, when they were supposed to be correcting it with a red pen or something. Um, if a student wants to cheat, if they want to, to circumvent the, uh, the situation, uh, you know, or in whatever situation they're in, if they want to circumvent the, the rules or, or cheat or private chat, they'll find a way to do it. Um, but these are some ways to, to curb, you know, what is, um, you know, the most usual way that students attack these things. Uh, so, so be aware of those. Okay. Um, another thing um, to encourage you to do is to keep the students engaged. And if you keep the students engaged, um, typically, if it's a really good conversation, it's a good lecture, if you're, if, if you've got a really good, um, uh, you know, academic experience happening for the student, that typically will keep them engaged. And a couple of things to consider. If you follow a regular rotation, so for example, in some of our work, the students answer questions before they come to class, and I'll call on the student to answer the question, and this leads into a discussion. 
Um, but if you go in a rotation and they get used to that rotation, then when it gets about to be their turn, they kind of zone out because they're looking at their answer and they're getting ready to answer online. And so one thing you can do is to kind of change it up a little bit, uh, but make sure that all the students are engaged. Everybody gets to, to um, participate in answering questions of the Socratic discussion and, and make sure that they're engaged. But, but keep them guessing a little bit. Uh, mix it up if you can so that they're not anticipating when it's their turn and, and you know, they, they kind of zone out and, and focus on giving their answer. Um, use the chat box to have students answer general questions. Um, or sometimes I'll use the chat box if, if I have them uh, do a short writing exercise in class, like an impromptu writing exercise. I'll have them cut and paste their answers into the chat box sometimes. Um, but typically, unless it's a general answer um, or a poll or something that I'm just, you know, asking the students a general question, I want them to use their microphone. And I really think this is, you know, this might be more of a pedagogical thing um, as, as a teacher, but I really think it's a mistake that a lot of online teachers make in um, pushing the students to the chat box and just answering in the chat. It's good um, as an ancillary tool but it shouldn't be the primary focus. Make them turn on their microphone, answer the question, discuss or, or dialogue, and then mute themselves again. And, and so um, really engaging the students and keeping them engaged is gonna be a real helpful for a, for a good academic experience. Um, another thing that we do is we, in the classroom is, is we teach, and, and I've heard it called a lot of things. Uh, one of those is, um, oops. Um, we call this uh, netiquette, and um, here's it's just basically etiquette online. What what are some things uh, that students should know? Number one, have them raise their virtual hand when they're participating in a class discussion. If they want to add to this discussion, they can raise their hand, and then you can call on them to do that. Sometimes it's difficult. A student will you know have their hand up like this and barely see the tip of their fingers under you know over the over the screen, or they have it back behind their head and you don't know if they're really raising their hand. So just have them use the virtual um, hand raising tool, and and have them use that. Have students mute themselves when they're not talking. If there's um, other noise in the background, uh, we've had students. Uh, you know, the homeschoolers and uh, the construction workers doing work on their house couldn't do it any other day. And so there's construction going on in the background. And so make sure their mics are muted when they're not talking. If a student disagrees, and if we're going to have a lot of debates and discussions, these disagreements are going to come up. Um, netiquette says, you know, the, this kind of um, etiquette that they're going to use, always be polite, stick to the point of the argument, Use clear arguments and proofs and never use ad hominem. Never speak to the man. We're not going to call names or um, tell them their idea is dumb. Uh, we're going to engage the point and have rational discourse, and we're going to do it politely. Certainly disagree if that's the case, but do it politely. Another thing I tell students, and, and this is going to be somewhat subjective, but uh, tell them only add interesting remarks that advance the conversation or the argument. In other words, don't, you know, don't jump on and say, well, one time my grandpa and tell a story um, that seemed to be related, but really has no uh, relevance at advancing the argument. Uh, and tell the students up front, you want to hear from them, you want them to be engaged, but they're only allowed to say interesting things that add to the conversation that are directly related to discussion, and they will add value and advance the argument. Um, Another thing, if a, if a student needs to leave the class for whatever reason, they need to step away, use the restroom or something, um, a, a great policy to have is have the student uh, private chat you and say, I'm going to step away for a second. Uh, in my classroom, if a student needs to uh, use the restroom, they don't need to raise their hand or do anything. And all they do is they simply let me know I'm stepping away. They turn off their camera and mute their mic and they're gone. If they're back within a few seconds, you know, 30 seconds or a minute or so, um, they're good to go. If they do that repeatedly in a the class, then we're going to have a conversation with their parent. Uh, but, but typically, um, when you give, you know, students uh, this kind of, of, you know, privilege, they're not embarrassed to let, let you know um, that they need to step away. Uh, usually, they use that very responsibly. Um, another thing is uh, don't let them interrupt the class uh, by raising their hand and saying, uh, I need to go someplace, uh, or uh, a stray topic or stray chat in the, in the text. 
Uh, one year I had to uh, involve a parent where I had a student, uh, every time we'd get into a conversation, he would turn the conversation in the chat box towards, you know, superheroes and comic books. And, and it would end up, you know, the whole chat box is going in a different direction while we're having class. And so you want to nip that in the bud very early, very quickly. Um, and sometimes one way to do that, if you have to, is just turn off chat altogether. And, and you can do that in the settings. Okay. Um, finally, the last thing is, unless it's specific to a particular way that, that you're operating in class, try to get the students to avoid using the internet and um, texting slang and, and have them, you know, writing complete sentences and, and answer. Uh, a lot of times our students will use like a carrot. If they agree with somebody above them, uh, I'll allow some of those kinds of, of interaction. It's just easy to say, oh yeah, I agree with that. Um, but, but typically we want to avoid that as, as good um, etiquette practice. All right, um, we're about wrapped up here. Um, finally, uh, the last thing I just wanna mention, and I'm gonna spend some more time on this when we, um, on next Thursday when, when we meet again, but there's a lot of tools in Zoom that you can leverage. And there's a, you can share your screen, you can, um, you can share the whiteboard, um, you can uh, connect to a device. As a matter of fact, um, just for fun, I'm going to, uh, I'll share with you, I'll, I'll just do a little uh, example here. And I'm going to share my, um, this is my device. And I'm going to turn on my, Center here. Okay. So I can bring up a photo. Here we have Thomas Gold's consummation of uh, uh, the course of empire. And so this is um, this is coming right off of my iPad, so I'm just sharing, just connected by a cable, and sharing my iPad, sharing a screen, and you can, you know, move that around. Um, another thing that uh, is a is a great feature, uh, and you may not have all of these tools, but for example, if you want, you've got a whiteboard on, on Zoom, uh, but here's a whiteboard. I just use my Apple Pen, and um, I can write right on here and show that to the, um, you know, to the students. And, and so these are, are, you know, these are some great tools that you can, um, that you can utilize. Uh, let's see here, the whiteboard directly on Zoom. This is not connected, uh, but it's a little difficult to write with a mouse, but you can draw with it. Um, and if you're really good at writing, uh, you can use that as well. So there's a lot of share features that, um, uh, that you can use on Zoom. And let's see here. I guess I need to bring this back up and get us back to, nope, that's not the right one. Wrong one. Um, there we go. Now, let's see, where did it go? Well, in any case, I don't know what I just did with that screen. I lost that screen. But in any case, as we as we wrap this up, um, the the key that a um, couple keys I just want to let you know is there is uh, you can leverage the tools from Zoom, and those are very helpful tools. Um, a couple of other things that I would encourage to use in an online class that are very very helpful for students and something that um, that you have the opportunity to use. Uh, this is often exclusive. Um, it's not completely exclusive, but it's a lot easier to use these when you're teaching online than say in a brick and mortar classroom sometime. But you can use a lot of props like maps, um, 
texts, you know, like you can, you can put a, a, a book up on the screen, uh, notes, artwork, slides, PowerPoint, um, you know, websites, videos. And, and I encourage these used um, in an ancillary form, not as the, the center focus. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do recitations uh, in the next webinar that, that I'm going to do. Um, but there's a lot of different approaches, question and answer, uh, recitation proper, uh, how to debate, uh, Socratic dialogue, interpretive questions, a lot of different approaches um, to using um, the online uh, classroom very, very effectively. And so we'll talk about that next Thursday. Next Tuesday, uh, we'll have Brian Daigle, uh, who will be discussing how to give a, a lecture. And then I'll discuss how to do a Socratic discussion. And then Tim Griffith will be talking about how to uh, use uh, workshops. Um, Okay, um, so let's let's do this. Daniel, do we have some questions that I can answer? Uh, I want to take some questions and answers, and uh, I'll try to answer these questions. Uh, yes, there was the um, uh, two questions were, were put in the, I sent them to your chat. Do you see those? Okay, let me see here. Um, I've answered a lot of the questions that I, um, that were, I knew answers for, but there were two questions that I thought I'd let you answer. Okay, let me see if I can find these here. In here the I will uh, put them back at the bottom. Here we okay, go. thank you. All right. Um, wondering how this would change some of the points that you're making. Silvas, for example, are making connections. Okay, so um, the the question. Let's see. Uh, Karina asked the question that this is this useful. Uh, but so if you're not a new teacher, you're not at the beginning of the semester and you're 10 weeks in, um, how would you change some of the points that you're making? So in other words, a syllabus. Well, one of the great things that you could do is, um, is setting up um, your syllabus, um, you know, moving it to online doesn't have to change a whole lot. Um, you know, if, if the rest of your school year is going to look the same. But what you're going to need to do is give a revised syllabus that's going to give them the classroom link. Where do, what, where do they come in? And, and you don't have to, and I think this answers another uh, question here um, that uh, somebody asked, how can you, um, you know, uh, do the students need to log in or can you give them a link? You can give the students just a link and when they by using that link, they just come right into the classroom. Now the thing is anybody who has that link and it doesn't have a password, anybody has that link can, can log in. Um, but um, it's very easy to kill a classroom and, and send out a new link if say somebody uh, inappropriately shared it with somebody else. Uh, but, uh, but just sending the students a link is really easy. And then I would just adjust the syllabus for what's left in the school year. And, and the only thing really that's going to change is the information of, of um, what is your CMS going to look like? What is your um, online platform going to look like? And how do the students going to, to interact with you? So really, you're just giving them that information. But I don't know that really you're um, unless your school year has changed, I don't know that a lot of that's going to be different if the, if the school calendar uh, has changed. So I'm not sure if I'm answering that question um, correctly, but that, that would be the best way to answer that, I think. Um, all right, let me see here. Is it important to set a, a meeting time or can you just give the students a link to your meeting room uh, or the pros and cons to each? So, um, we always have a meeting time, if, if you mean for, for classroom. I know some teachers set um, classroom hour or, or office hours using Zoom. And so, uh, for example, I know one teacher, and what they'll do is they'll say, my office hours are from, say, Monday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. They just log into Zoom, and they continue to do whatever their work in the office, and a student can pop in the, the link and say, you know, uh, hey, Mr. So-and-so, um, I have a real quick question about this and uh, they can take a few minutes and, and discuss that. So that's, um, that's one way you could use Zoom as, a, as an online office hours. Uh, but I typically, uh, we have a meeting time. Uh, we start and finish on time and uh, the students have that link and they log in uh, just during that time. Uh, typically we've not had a lot of problems Every once in a while, you'll have a student, you know, pop in or something and uh, to a classroom, uh, but that's really been far and few between. Okay, let's see. Um, trying to answer all these questions here. Um, and, and Karina, if, if I did not answer your question, um, perhaps if 
you could rephrase it and I would be happy to try to tackle that again. Uh, do I have to have a Mac to connect to an iPad to Zoom just like you did? I don't believe you have to have a Mac. Um, I believe Zoom itself, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I guess maybe Daniel, you can answer this Correct. question. Yeah, you, you don't have to have a Mac. It's using the uh, AirPlay technology. And so you do have to have an iOS device um, th th to, for sharing. So that you can be on a PC, um, but, the, but as long as you're, the device you're sharing is an iOS device, so an iPad or an iPhone or probably even an iPod Touch, then it'll work just fine. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, I think we answered this question about setting a meeting time. So Zoom allows you to see each person in the meeting. The whiteboard features were Zoom tools or ones that you have. Um, the whiteboard features are Zoom tools. And um, uh, so, for example, if uh, Daniel, you wanted to pop back in here just so we could share it, I'll pop up the whiteboard. And I believe, I, I think our, um, the attendees, I think you can all see the little screen um, and it has both Daniel and I, you can see it. And if you have more students online there, uh, they will all show up. And so you, you can look at all the students. View you're in. So okay. gallery view or speaker view, that's a, an important little tip is uh, gallery view versus uh, speaker view. And the video I linked at the beginning, I go into a little more detail about how to use those features. But um, if you toggle, if you're in the, um, uh, I believe the attendees can do this. I'm actually a normal, this is a webinar, so it's a little bit different than a normal um, Zoom meeting, but I'm able to, to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. And if I'm in speaker view, I just see Scott and the shared whiteboard. And if I'm in gallery view, I see everyone. Exactly. Yep. Very good. Okay. And I've had a couple questions about um, uh, uh, whether the, the recording will be available. So I'll just answer it here. We will have this recording available shortly on the Kepler Facebook page and uh, YouTube page. So you can watch for them there and share them uh, with, with whoever you like. Excellent. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, what do you use to turn in homework? Uh, do you just have them email the homework to you and email the graded homework back? Very good question. So there's a, there's a few different options that you can use for the homework. Um, for example, at Kepler, we're building the CMS right into the platform. So the students will turn their homework in there. They'll get their grades right there. That's going to happen, um, um, you know, directly uh, with our platform. But if um, for somebody that's uh, using a different, um, you know, maybe you're in Zoom, you're in a different school, then uh, there are uh, tools like ClassReach or ThinkWave um, that uh, are third-party CMSs where uh, they, you can set up uh, assignments and everything online. ClassReach is really helpful because it's a dollar per student per month. And so any student, anything under 25 students is free. So if you have a small school and um, you have a handful of students, um, it, it's, it's um, fairly inexpensive. And even if you have a lot of students, um, it's, it's not very expensive for a third party CMS. Uh, Google Docs is also very helpful using uh, Google Drive. Uh, for my students, I'll give you, maybe I'll just share this, might be a help. Uh, for my students, I use, um, when I do their grading, I'm gonna pull this up and share the screen with you. Um, give me one second. This is one of those examples. It'd be good if I knew I was gonna do this, I'd be prepared in advance. We can do it pretty quick. So here's um, one way that you can do grades very simply. And so here is a, here's a folder where um, different courses, this is the student folders, and then each student has a folder that I've created and I share with them. And then those students, when you click on that, they uh, turn their homework in. They can upload it as a PDF right to this folder. Uh, the other thing they can do is open a, a Google Doc right in their folder and answer questions or write a paper. And so Google, uh, it, it doesn't provide really a CMS, but it does provide a very um, collaborative way uh, for students to turn in their, their assignments. And then you can grade their papers right in their folder and they can see it in real time. And then I typically just email their grades if, if we don't have a CMS um, that we're using. Uh, so that's another way uh, to do that. Um, 
Can I you show? I've been here. Oh, yeah. I have a, uh, um, a question about uh, any other tips for keeping students engaged online? Uh, some of my students who are normally engaged in a normal classroom are much quieter online. And I think that you, as well as Brian and um, Brian Daigle and Tim Griffith, would be talking more specifically about that kind of thing in the next webinar. Is that correct, Scott? That is correct. Uh, we're going to talk about how to do Socratic dialogue. Tune back how to in. Teach... What's that? So tune back in. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tune in again. <laughs> Tuning in for the, for the rest of the, the webinar series, uh, Monday, uh, Brian Daigle will be talking about how to give a lecture, how to keep the students engaged in a lecture. Uh, next Thursday, I'll be talking about how to do Socratic discussion. Um, uh, there's about four or five different ways that you can do discussions in classes to keep the students engaged. So I'm going to talk about all of those, all the different ones that I use uh, that we have found effective over the years and a few tips on um, how to handle students who are not engaged. Um, so, um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth there. So I'd, lo I'd love to discuss that. And Tim Griffith uh, is going to focus on um, workshopping right. and languages. I just wanted to. Correct. Yes. The, the very last one that last Monday, we'll, we'll do the um, languages and workshops. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure I'm not missing. Somebody asked about graphing. Um, I just saw it now. Okay. How to use mathematical graphs in Zoom. And um, I'm not sure how to answer that question because I don't know exactly what is being asked. If you're talking about like graph paper for mathematics, um, one way to do it is um, uh, for students to show their work. Um, you can use, um, uh, like I was just showing with the, with the iPad, you can use the camera on an iPhone and, and students can show their work by just connecting to Zoom. Uh, that That's my... Uh, that might be one way, uh, but I have a feeling you're asking about something different, and so I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering that well, how to use mathematical graphs. Uh, if you want to clarify, I'd be happy to, to try to follow up with that. Okay, let's see. Um, correct. Uh, so the question was, you plugged in your iPad and it cast to your laptop. That's exactly what happened. I plugged it in uh, just to a USB, just a regular cord that you used to charge with and uh, plugs right into your iDevice, your iOS device, and then plugs into a USB port in your, la in your laptop or your, your desktop. Um, Jennifer can you asked, show? Oh, go ahead. Jennifer asked about equipment to, in order to use Zoom, just a webcam and mic. Uh, and so we, we use the, uh, whether, if, it's, if it's not a built-in webcam, we uh, at Roman Roads and Kepler, we have a few of these uh, Logi, uh, Logitech. Um, I think they're the C120s, but they run for about $60, $70, and they're actually very high quality with a good mic built in. Um, uh, uh, Iowa, Macs generally have pretty good built-in webcams, uh, but you just need a webcam, a mic, and a Zoom account. So super simple. Uh, Zoom has made it very, very, very simple to use. Okay. Um, let me see. Can you use, uh, can you show books and, and things um, without, without copyright issues? Um, yes. There, you're, you're not, you're not republishing um, the information by sharing a book or, or, um, uh, you know, or, or having a display online. Um, it would be very similar if, you know, if a, student is, um, you know, if you're going to show a text, a PDF, most of these are in public domain anyway, but if you're going to show a PDF online or you're going to annotate and use a camera, a document camera uh, to, to annotate uh, or explicate a text or something uh, by, uh, by using a camera, uh, there's no copyright issue by, um, by displaying that. Um, okay, let's see, Monday and Thursday. I think homework we answered. I've invited my school to participate in this webinar series, but perhaps a little too late. I found this one especially helpful. If people were late, will they have access? Yes, uh, we will make that available online. The recording will be made available. Um, and uh, those of you who signed up, uh, Daniel will make sure you get that. Uh, with so many schools switching to online due to the coronavirus situation, do you have any recommendations to help with a smooth transition from in-class to online? Um, thank you for any ideas uh, that you can share. The, the one, the one recommendation I would I would make is to begin with the end in mind and work backward. So set a date for, you know, when is the school going to transition? And this is something that we're doing. I'll plug it right here. One of the things that we're doing with Kepler 
is that we are, um, uh, many of our teachers are going to offer eight week courses uh, for those students who are displaced, uh, their cl school's closed. They are gonna teach for free. They're gonna teach an entire quarter. They're gonna offer several different classes. And the way that we've set it up is that we, um, you know, we have a, a set date. We're gonna start classes start Monday, or, uh, Monday the 30th of March. They'll go to May 22nd. And then uh, what we're doing is having the students uh, or the, the teachers prepare all of their um, you know, the syllabus for uh, the different syllabi for these classes that are eight weeks long, and then we'll begin registering students next week. So we kind of worked backwards. And I think maybe if you're transitioning to from a brick and mortar school to an online school, um, if you wanted to give us a call or uh, shoot an email to us, we'd be happy maybe to set up a time and discuss some of the particulars. But working backward from the time that you want to start classes and then filling in what has to be done before then. The very first thing I would say is setting up Zoom accounts and getting um, you know, the number of, of classrooms you'll need for your teachers and, and, and getting all your teachers set up on Zoom. I think that would be the very first thing. Next thing is to get your syllabi um, and then have your, um, the date set for when those classes are gonna begin. That's a very broad brush. Be happy maybe to discuss that further uh, in more particular. Um, okay, can you, let me see here, uh, can more than one person annotate on the screen at the same time? Yes. So if you're using the whiteboard, um, students can write on the whiteboard and you can write on the whiteboard at the same time and, and you can go into the settings and, and uh, prohibit the students from writing on the whiteboard. So you have complete control of that. Uh, the link, uh, if you signed up for this webinar, I believe they will email the link to this video to you, uh, to this webinar, so you'll get that. Sorry, I'm going really quick here. Just want to make sure I get these all in. We're kind of at the top of the hour. Uh, have any thoughts or advice, suitable age range for online classes? Personally, um, uh, our, you know, uh, our philosophy is 13 and above. Uh, I, I have had a couple of 12 year old uh, students, uh, but typically, uh, and, and there, are some, there are some institutions that are playing with the idea of, of bringing younger students into an online environment. Personally, I think 7th through 12th grade are um, adept and ready for that. Younger students need to be um, in an embodied experience. That's, you know, that's my opinion, pedagogical opinion. But um, we really feel like, you know, 13 and above or junior high age and above uh, is about the best time to, to start that. Um, if the, if the younger students are involved, parents are going to have to be very directly involved. They're going to have to be very hands-on if younger than junior high students are going to um, uh, be in an online classroom. Okay. Um, is there any way to have a graph on Zoom to teach them to do things like uh, parabolas? I, I see, Anna Marie, um, it's a really good question. I know that you can set up a document camera that Zoom, you just plug in just like the iOS advice, uh, a device, I'm sorry, that you can actually write on a graph. You can have students do the same thing. And um, I don't know of a graph that Zoom has, uh, but I do believe there are third party apps that do have graphs that you can use on your iPad and, and, and an Apple pen. And so that would be an extra expense or an extra um, app. But then what you would do is just plug right into your iPad, open that app up, and then uh, work on that graph. Uh, that would be my best suggestion uh, for, for doing math graphs. Okay, let's see. Um, we show books, uh, but can we read them without copyright problems? How do you handle integrity and assessments? Okay, first questions. Um, I know of no copyright problems with reading books um, or discussing books online. Uh, there's no copy. I mean, you think about a classroom, um, a brick and mortar classroom, they buy a textbook or a book and uh, they're reading it in class, and they're sharing it with each other. Um, as the only way is if you were uh, if you were taking copyrighted material and publishing it as your own uh, for sale, then you know you would probably have some problems there. But otherwise, there wouldn't be any real issues there. Daniel, you want to comment? Just, on yeah, that? real quick. Um, so, uh, fair use doctrine is basically the ability to use copyrighted material for um, there's there's four basic tenets that allow you to do that, and the most important ones are commentary and criticism. Um, or uh, parody. So that's what um, uh, allows a, a, a 
uh, people to do to criticize copyrighted material. If it's a parody on YouTube, it's always allowed because it falls under parody. So if you are, uh, if you are, if it is a something you're selling that doesn't work, but if you are taking the work and then uh, talking about it, commenting on it, criticizing it, um, discussing it, that falls under fair use and there's no copyright issue. Fantastic. Okay, uh, let's see, last question that I see here. Um, what courses are we going to be offering? Um, so real quickly, uh, courses that are going to be, uh, that are gonna be offered, uh, I'll tell you real quickly. Um, right now, uh, I'm finding it here. <laughs> So far, we have um, several units from the old Western culture, early moderns, uh, poetry and politics. We have the novels, that's Jane Austen, Brothers Karamazov, um, and um, uh, I think some Dickens, Christmas Carol, and, and, and so forth. Uh, some C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Uh, there's the rise of England, a lot of Shakespeare plays, uh, early medievals. We have introduction to Spanish conversation. Uh, there's some, uh, of course, uh, deep read on Mark Twain. Uh, I believe it's Huckleberry Finn and another deep read on um, the uh, Consolation of Philosophy with Boethius. Um, An abridged fundamentals of music is going to be taught. Uh, Defense of the Faith um, course, that's unit two from Christendom. Uh, those are some church fathers. Uh, the Aeneid, I see philosophers, Greek histories, uh, the medieval mind, uh, which is going to be Thomas Aquinas and, um, and Dante. We have Roman history. We have the epics, um, the Enlightenment, Reformation, historians. So we, we've got a number of classes that are, uh, we've got rhetoric, introduction to rhetoric. I believe we're going to have a logic class. Um, what else am I missing here? drama and lyric. So just, uh, there's, there's tons of humanities, logic, rhetoric, uh, language, and uh, those are all free courses. Uh, they're eight week, full on um, flipped classroom approach. And so our Kepler teachers are offering those for free as a way to serve uh, the community um, where students are displaced from, from all the uh, coronavirus um, scare and things that are going on with that. And so we'll, we'll have those up on our, our platform here on Monday for folks to begin registering. We say they're free, technically they're $1, uh, but uh, they're $1 per student, uh, but you know, they're virtually free. There's no materials to buy. Uh, we have several, uh, Roman Roads is one of them, uh, uh, several um, uh, uh, curriculum things that are donating, teachers are donating their time, they're just here to try to serve. So if that would benefit you at all, uh, stand by, you know, take a look at the website. And um, I think we're going to be putting out a video about this later uh, today or tomorrow. And um, so we'll give you more information. Okay. Um, we're about seven minutes over the hour. Daniel, any others that I missed? Um, any closing remarks before we go? I know I did that really fast. So I apologize if, uh, if you want to go back and look at it. I hope you do. Well, thank you so much for joining. There, there was that one other question. I don't know if we have time for that, Scott, but um, thank you all for joining and uh, do tune in for the others. This was more the basics and the mechanics of the online virtual classroom. The other three sessions will we'll, uh, talk more about the pedagogy and more of the, the uh, tips for actually using and making that effective in the actual teaching, uh, depending on the mode of teaching. So lecture, uh, recitation, flip classroom, and then workshop. Those are three different ways you can use these, these online tools. So those will go into more detail, um, but thank you so much for coming. Absolutely, thank you all. Um, one, th that question, Daniel, I'll just answer real quick. Somebody asked about um, the ability to uh, the test integrity and and I can try to talk about this next Thursday but the one thing I would mention is that we um, we include and and really um, you know uh, encourage parental involvement in the proctoring of tests uh, but there are some ways that you can proctor online so we could talk about that next week <laughs>